Friday night. There's a singles activity. Uh, you might want to see Brother Terry and Miss Vinnie about that. And then next Sunday, we have a guest uh, speaker, John Harris. He is going to Belize, so you might want to make sure you stop by for that. And that's all for this morning, so give preacher a lot of time. Amen? Hey. All right, let's take our hymnals again. Let's stand and turn to page number 394. Page number 394. like thine can be so poor. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee on that four. Charlie Faulkner, would you pray for the offer? Hey. Father, we thank you for this place and for this ministry and this place to bless the offer. Yes. Help us to reach and help us to uh, be a part of the gospel to the world. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for that. Let's take our hymnals again. Let's stand and turn to page number 230. Amen. Page number 230. We'll sing the first and fourth verse. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Will pardon and cleanse with 
may never own a lot of this world's riches. I can boast of all the things that I have seen. But there's one thing I can say and really mean it. By the grace of God, my soul has been redeemed. By the grace of God, by the grace of God, I'll take it to a land that has no sorrow. And I'll hear my Savior say, Welcome in. By the grace of God, you've won. Very pilgrim, welcome home. Many times along my way, I am discouraged. And the devil tries to make me doubt God's word. Then I steal away, I call upon my Savior. By the grace of God, my prayer is always heard. By the grace of God, oh, by the grace of God, I'll make it to a land that has no sorrow. And I'll hear my Savior say, welcome in. By the grace of God, you've won. Weary pilgrim, welcome home. When my days are spent and I must sleep in Jesus, in a turf seal grave somewhere beneath the sod, I'll arise, proclaim, my Savior reigns forever. By the grace of God, my prayer was always heard. By the grace of God, oh, by the grace of God, I'll make it to a land that has no sorrow. And I'll hear my Savior say, welcome in. By the grace of God, you've won. Weary pilgrim, welcome home. By the grace of God, oh, by the grace of God, I'll make it to a land that has no sorrow. And I'll hear my Savior say, welcome in. By the grace of God, you've won. Weary pilgrim, welcome home. All right, take your Bibles, please. Turn over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I told her I could hear that song once a month. I love that song. That is the theme song for the year, as far as I am concerned. And thank you so much. Miss Polly, for that. Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Ephesians chapter 4 is where we will begin. Verse number 29, and we're going to read down to the end of this chapter. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. By the way, clamor is shouting vehemently. Shouting with anger and shouting to, to, uh, to hurt somebody. And so he says, get rid of that. And then evil speaking, but be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind, one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Lord, thank you for the grace of God that has worked in our hearts, brought us to church today. Grace of God that saved us, the grace of God that's changed our life and as Paul said and testified that uh, by the grace of God I am what I am and that's my certainly my testimony here this morning and the testimony of all of us Lord and we're so grateful now Lord help us to learn about this thing of grace in our speech and grace in our lips and with our tongue and Lord what a powerful powerful thing we have in this mouth of ours, and yet so much damage it could do, and yet so much good it, it can do. 
And so we sometimes go back and forth, and we ought not to, Lord. Uh, help us to get this thing fixed in our life. Fixed by getting it right, but fixed by keeping it right. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing again. If you would, please be seated. And so we've been talking about speaking grace and, um, and I, I, honestly, I didn't think that I would go this long about grace, but as I've said many times, it is an, uh, an inexhaustive subject. The more and more that I look at my Bible and read it and study it concerning this. And now, so the, the premise of, of this, these messages on speaking grace, really, it, it, it's twofold. And the first premise is this, is that saving grace should lead to speaking grace. That, that's the premise of the message. If you're saved by grace, then that grace should be changing your heart. But at the same time, if it changes your heart, it should be changing your, your speech, the way that you speak. In fact, look at, if you would please, over James chapter 1 and thought about this verse this week. And I just want you to see this. This is so important. It really kind of just gives it a little more oomph. To it, if you would. And so look at James chapter 1 and verse number 26. Of course, James is a book that in James chapter 3, James really preaches about the tongue and really brings that thing home about how dangerous a tongue can be and how important it is. And look what he says here in verse 26. This is powerful to me. He says here, if any man among you seem to be religious. Now, we don't use that word anymore because it's a word that we use in a negative way. That typically a religion, when we think of a religion, and kind of by definition, it is a man-made thing. And of course, we don't have a religion. We have a faith. Amen. Jesus Christ is the one that brought this into our life. And so that's the kind of the way we look at religion today. But the word religious there means fearing or worshiping God. Fearing or worshiping God. So he's talking about people that, that uh, say they fear God, that they say they worship God. But look what then says. And, and, but then notice the very next thing. And what's that next word? Bridalist. A horse is controlled by that bridle right in his, in his mouth and controls it and bridleth not, doesn't control, controls not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. How, well, how does he deceive his own? By thinking he fears God, by thinking he worships God, and yet he doesn't know how to control his tongue. He doesn't know how to use his mouth and his speech in a way that shows grace. Isn't that powerful? And then look at this. And so he's deceiving his own heart that this man's religion, and what is that last word is what? It's empty. This person is empty. And so this thing of our speech, our words, our tongue, it really is a powerful testimony of that God is working in your life. And if you're not controlling and careful about the words that you say, then he says, I don't say this, but, but there's a clear indication, number one, that, boy, God is not working your life, or a person like that might not even be saved. If they say they love God and they fear God, and yet they still cuss, without any... Uh, uh, shame at all, use the Lord's name in vain? And they call themselves a Christian? And they use vulgar, profane language? They see nothing wrong with cutting people down? Criticizing people? They spend their days gossiping? God says if you are someone, you say, I love God, fear God, but you can't control your tongue in those areas and many others, then my friend, your religion is empty. That's pretty powerful to me. You know, I, 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 in some ways, I think this may be one of the most important things I can preach. And which comes to the next premise of these messages, and the premise is pretty much... 
the furtherance of the gospel and the building up of the church depends on our speech. Ponder that for a minute. Now, people can look at your life and, and say, boy, that person is saved. But at some point, you've got to tell them. So your speech, giving people the gospel with your words and then backing up that gospel with the way that you talk other times around that person is so important. And then the building of the church. Why do we come to church to hear a teacher teach and a preacher preach? And so this thing of speaking grace, saving grace, should be seen in your life by speaking grace. How you use your words, how you use your speech in your life, and how vital that is. So we talked about the fact that why do we need speaking grace? Well, we need it really for two groups of people. The first group of people that we need speaking grace for, and I already alluded to that, is that those that are without, those that are unsaved. So we've got to have the right kind of speech so that when the opportunity is given to us, that when we talk to them about the gospel, the way we've been talking and the way we've been living, because remember what he said, walk wisely. So that means your life has to back up what you say that you are and that you should never do anything that would cause someone to not want to hear the gospel from your mouth. And so we do it for those that are are without. Then secondly, we talked about the fact that we do it for those that are within. And that's where we stop, for those that are within. Who are you talking about, preacher? We're talking about those that are saved, those that are part of the family of God, those that are people that we come to church, we see them all the time, we fellowship with them. we got to make sure that we are speaking with grace in our lips for them. And that's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29. So why do we do that? And Paul says it. Look at Ephesians 4 verse number 29. We see two things here. He says, first of all, he says, for the use of what? Edifying. For the use of edifying. A woman got on a bus. She was holding a baby. And the bus driver said, that's the ugliest baby I have ever seen. In a huff, the woman slammed her fare into the fare box and took an aisle seat near the rear of the bus. The man seated next to her sensed that she was agitated and asked her what was wrong. And she replied, the bus driver insulted me. The man sympathized and he said, why? He's a public servant and shouldn't say things to insult passengers. You're right, she said. I think I'll go back up there and give him a piece of my mind. That's a good idea, the man said. Here, let me hold your monkey. <laughs> it is it is amazing to me how few people truly know what it means to edify. And I say that with all seriousness. Many people have no idea, and it, sometimes of no fault of their own. There are many homes, they have no idea how to edify in those homes. How to build up. Because that's what it means to edify. I mean, now, that guy in the bus, that, that is funny, amen? And, but you know what? He actually was trying to edify, wasn't he? But he blew it. And as a pastor, I've seen people who sincerely try to edify, but they blow it. They don't understand the principle of apples of gold in pitchers of silver. And, and we'll look at that later on. But the idea of edifying, that's why he, and by the way, that's why Paul, talking to God's people now, let's re remind ourselves of this, that one of the first things he says before he tells about the edifying, he says, look what it says, he says, let no, what? Corrupt, Corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. He is not talking to lost people, he is talking to born again, blood washed, supposed to be Holy Spirit filled Christians. The word corrupt means foul, putrefy, rotten. It was used in referring to rotten vegetables or fruit or meats. Uh, folks have been bringing 
vegetables to our church. And we have a bunch back there this afternoon, by the way. You can go back and get them. But folks have been bringing uh, vegetables to our church. Now, what would you think if the, the people that brought those vegetables didn't bring the good ones, but they, they, bought, they brought the ones that were rotting? And they put the rotting vegetables in the kitchen. I know what you would think. You would think, how could they do that? How could they come to church and bring rotting fruit or rotting vegetables? And you know what? That's what Paul is teaching. How in the world can a Christian bring corrupt communication into their home? How in the world can a Christian bring corrupt communication into their job? How in the world, how in the world can a Christian bring corrupt communication into a church fellowship, into a church service, into a church Sunday school? Everybody okay? How can a Christian do that? Do Christians do that? Absolutely. Some do. Some have. Some will. That kind of speech should never, again, I'm not saying it. He said, let no. You know what no means? No. None. Zilch. Nada. Amen? None. That should be your goal. Are we going to blow it? Absolutely. Do I blow it? Absolutely. But my goal every day is none. None of it. I don't want any corrupt communication to come out of my mouth. None. Never out of the mouth of a Christian should come evil speaking. Deceit, cursing, lying, perverseness, destruction, vanity, flattery, foolishness, false teaching, boasting, hatred, swearing, filthy talk, gossip, off-color jokes, profanity, dirty stories, vulgarity. The Lord's name in vain. Never should that ever come out of the mouth of a blood-washed Christian, born-again Christian, ever. Somebody say amen. amen. Ever. That's what he said. I'm emphasizing it a bit more, of course, embellishing a bit more, but I believe God would want me to do that. Why? Because our speech is so powerful. The Bible says that in your tongue uh, is life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so no corrupt communication. The, by the way, the things I just read, those are, those are characteristics of people that are unsaved. Unregenerated, ungodly, unholy in the heart and mouth. I don't want to be associated with anything like that. I was ungodly, unregenerated, unholy in my words when I was in the military. But boy, that's third year of my military life. I got saved. And boy, wasn't but two weeks after that, my speech changed. I stopped it all. Nobody said, stop your cussing. The Holy Spirit said, stop your cussing. Stop your cussing. Stop using the Lord's name, which I used all the time. Terrible words I used. But after I got saved, the grace of God had come into my heart and did a, such a wonderful thing. It wasn't just but a couple of weeks that the grace of God got into my mouth and stopped me from saying terrible things I used to say. So grace, these are not the characteristics of a, of a saved person. 
These are of uh, unsaved persons. Paul wrote in Colossians 3 8. Look at, look at Colossians 3 8. Man, I'm never going to get through these things. You understand that, don't you? Colossians, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 8. I just want to make sure we understand this. Now, look what it says. But now, verse Colossians 3, but now, now, right now, ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice. By the way, how do you convey anger, wrath, malice? With your words. Then blasphemy with your words. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not. So basically, these are all things that you can you do in part or in whole, you do with your mouth. He says, he said, put it all off. All these things. Get rid of these things in your life. Why? Seeing that ye have put off the what? The old man. And that's a daily thing, by the way. With his deeds being unsaved, and have put on the Amen for the new man, the saved man, the Spirit of God, which is renewed in knowledge. And by the way, that's what I'm doing right now. I am renewing this principle in your life. Maybe you've known it, but you kind of forgot it. And maybe you've been, your words have not been the kind of words a Christian should use. And so I'm just renewing that in your knowledge right now and trying to help you with that. After the image of him. Who's him? Jesus Christ. That created him. So, we are to put off corruptible speech, and we are to put on grace speech, that which is good to the use of edify, that which is good to the use of building up. Now, he's not talking about, by the way, he's just not talking about when you come together at church. He's talking about your day-to-day -day conversation. Our speech to each other should always be. Now, please, it ought to be your goal every day. I don't care if you're at work or at home or you're in church, or you're going to the store, your goal should every day, everywhere, to everybody, I want to build them up. I want to build them up. When you go through a cashier, it ought to be your goal, I'm going to build him up. I'm going to encourage him. When I'm in the store, and maybe I bump into something, I want to build that person up in some way. Oh my, we ought to be building people all the time. As a child of building people all the time. Building up by using helpful, encouraging, thankful, praiseful, uplifting speech. And by the way, this is especially important in our homes. I understand, parents, the Bible says, provoke not your children to wrath. Do you know the majority of the time, the reason why we... Two ways we provoke our children to rest. Inconsistency in our Christian life is the first way. And second way is by our words. Promises that we make that we do not keep. Unkind words that we use, getting angry and saying things that we shouldn't have said. We provoke anger in our children. And so our homes are so vital. And, and, and in our marriages, man... The words that we use are so important. I married, I officiated the marriage of the president of the bank that I banked at in Bakersfield many years ago. And I kind of knew there was going to be a problem there, but because when I was going through the marriage vows and getting ready and, and going through it with them, where it said, where the woman says, and obey. And she had a problem with that. Of course, you have a problem with the Bible then, of course. But anyways, that's another message for another time. Amen. But listen to me. So she said, no. She said, boy, she said, I don't want that in there. I said, well, I'm not going to do the, the wedding if that's not in there. And so she reluctantly said, okay. And when I did it in the service, I saw it. I kind of smiled at her when she said it like that. Yeah, good job, you did it. Well, a few months later, they were having marital problems. And they lived in a beautiful, I mean, you know, she's a banker, and I forget, he was a doctor or something like that. And so they, she calls me up. Would you please come over? We're having problems. We just aren't getting along. Would you please come over? We just had a bad fight. 
I said, sure, I'll be right over. I drove down, but I kind of, it had been a while. I kind of forgot where the house was, so I got up. I thought it was the right one, but it wasn't. Went in the, knocked on the door, and it wasn't the right one. I thought, man, I know they're right around here. And so I'm walking. All of a sudden, I hear two people yelling at each other. <laughs> I immediately thought, that's the house. And sure enough, it was. You know what the sad thing is? Is there are so many Christians home where that's exactly what takes place. She yells at him, he yells at her. And it escalates and it escalates, and one keeps trying to get louder than the other one. I remember I had a couple in our church, they would get yell, 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 and all of a sudden they started punching the walls. And these are the same people that come to church, and they would just be so loving and spiritual. And they put it on, amen, when they should have put off that other stuff. What does the Bible say? Bible says that we are supposed to be building. We need grace speaking for those who are within for the use of edifying. Number two, to minister grace. To minister grace. And I forgot to get something I wanted to get. To minister grace. Look what it says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which the good to the use of building up edifying, that it may what? Minister grace unto the hearers. Minister. You know what it means? It means to serve. It means to give. It means to grant. It means to deliver. If I would have been mindful to remember, I wanted to get a pan and I wanted to get a towel and put it over my hand and have the pan here and put something on here and like a waiter. I want to give you some grace. And I'd like to give you some grace. And I'd like to give you some grace. See, that's that's what a Christian is supposed to do. We're supposed to be using this thing right here and going around and serving people and giving to people this whole idea of grace, ministering to them, helping them with this wonderful power of grace. And he says, how often let your speech be always with grace, it says in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6. And, and, and Pastor James, you know he was a real pastor because one of the things he had to really deal with was the tongue. And in James chapter 3, he gives us counsel on this thing of grace speaking in, his, in their speech as, as a Christian in the form of rebuke. Look at, look at James chapter 3. I wish I could go through that whole chapter, but we just do not have time. But look at James chapter 3 and look at verse number 10. And boy, if you've ever been a pastor, you're thinking... Hit that one again, James. But look what he says. He says, out of the same mouth proceedeth, what's that next word? Blessing. Blessing and the next word? Cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh now the fountain really is a spring and he's saying a, a spring cannot bring forth salt water and then later fresh water and he's trying to make the analogy the illustration by the way the fountain for a christian the springs of living water is your what is your heart the springs of living water is your heart out of the heart is where your words come. We've already started. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so he's talking about here that the fountain, he says, your fountain, if it's filled with grace, it's not going to bring forth bitter, angry, negative, critical words. And he writes, brethren, these things ought not so to be. You can't have them both. Now, will we veer off every once in a while? Yes. But he's talking for that your, and I, I, I don't have, I have the, your prevailing spirit of your words as a child of God should be grace. Are you all with me? Your prevailing spirit of your words should be graciousness. To where, when you veer from the graciousness, be it your spouse, be it your children, be it your co-workers, 
be it your fe- friends or fellow church members, when you veer from that graciousness, they're shocked. Boy, something must really be wrong for you to do that. But see, if a person's fountain is filled with the wrong things, then unfortunately that's going to be, that, that that's probably will end up becoming your prevailing spirit. See, our speech and the spirit of our speech should be consistently gracious and glorifying to God. And we shouldn't use one type of speech or one tone of speech at church and a different one at home. Or a different one at the workplace. Because you're around the buddies, you change. No. Your speech should be the same around saved people and lost people. It should be the same. That's what, that's what James is saying. That, listen, a fountain can't have both. And again, it goes back to the heart. Always does go back to the heart. Remember, and by the way, remember what Paul said, walk in wisdom. Wisdom, walking wisdom means the, the manner of your life, the way you live your life on a day-to-day basis. But here's what, here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 12. He said, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious. So if you're the kind of Christian that you're walking in wisdom, as Colossians chapter 4 teaches, then what's going to happen? More than likely, your words are going to be a gracious words. They're going to be the kind of words that honor Christ. Whether the four ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Is everybody okay? Do all to the glory of God. Of God. Can we all kind of admit it here? This is where we all live right here, isn't it? We live this every day. This is the battle every day. Do you ever heard the statement, well, bite your tongue? We as Christians need to learn to bite our tongues or bridle our tongues. Now, when we talk about this thing of ministering grace, what are we talking about? Okay, let's do this. Let's kind of break it down. Let's get a little more specific here. Because when I say that, you're still thinking, all right, but what does it mean to minister grace? And what is, what is grace words anyways? Well, number one, I would say that grace words are sweet words. Amen? Look, look at, if you would, the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, or verse number 24. Grace words are sweet words. Proverbs 16, 24. Notice what it says. Pleasant words, and, and I don't think I'm veering anywhere from the word of God when I put next to that speaking grace words, grace words, pleasant words, grace words, are as and what's that next word? Honeycomb. What's the next word? Sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Oh my, our words can be sweet with grace. And but look at look what he's saying there. Sweet to the soul. That's your inner person. That's your emotions, your, your seed of emotions, your 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 personality. And then Health to the bones, that is your body, that is your physical body, your physical health, your emotional health can be affected by the words of other people. One commentator says our speech should be as honeycomb. What do we get from honeycomb? We get what? Honey. We get honey from it. Honey is a natural source of sweetness. But it also gives strength. It gives health. It, it renews. Um, honeycomb, I, I, the benefits of honeycomb. Honeycomb is one of the most beneficial things you can eat. Uh, essential vitamins and minerals are in honeycomb. Uh, high nutrition supports heart health, boosts immune system, protects liver function, fights uh, 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 colds and flu season, improves gut health. I mean, they have all these things. And so we say, let your pleasant speech is like honeycomb. It brings health. It brings health to, your, to a person's soul, 
to their emotions. It, br it actually brings health to their body. You know, there are sometimes you can say words to somebody and it, it affects them in such a way that it actually hurts their health. Remember how Jonathan was fighting the Philistines and after fighting with all the rest of the armies of Israel, everybody was weak and Saul foolishly uh, pro proclaimed a curse that nobody can eat anything until we finish this thing. Well, Jonathan was actually with his armor bearer fighting some Philistines a ways away, and he won the battle, and he's coming back. And when he came back, God had provided. God had put honey all out there. And, and over there in 1 Samuel 4, 14, 27, but Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in an honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. What happened is he was given strength, he was given light, and his countenance, he man, it just as his countenance got better as a result of it. You know, when you're tired, oftentimes you know if somebody's tired, you can just look at their countenance. And by the way, you can look at somebody's countenance and see, well, they're sad. Well, they're hurt. Or there's something wrong just by looking at their countenance. And so Jonathan ate that honey, and oh, my soul, he got strength as a result of that. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. I think I understand better than I ever have why saving grace was meant to also give us speaking grace because of all the things our words can do. He says, a wholesome tongue, it's a tree of life. You give life. Or he says, a uh, uh, but perverseness, therein is a breach in the spirit. Have you ever gotten life from somebody by their words and when you left, you, you felt better than you were before you talked to them? Have, have you ever had that? You talked to somebody and said, man, they were so encouraging. And you didn't say that, but you're thinking, man, what a blessing. But have you also been with somebody and after you, they talked to you, you felt worse? See, why do we need speaking grace with each other? Why do we need these sweet words? Because you can, you can, you can give somebody life. They're having a hard time. They're going through some struggles and battles. I and mean, you may not even know what it is, but you sense that they need encouragement and you give it to them. But at the same time, if you're not careful with your words, it's a breach in the spirit. You can break somebody's spirit. You can wound somebody's spirit. And by the way, a wounded spirit, who can bear? Boy, the, the way you use your words and that grace, it is so important. I think of a lady that was coming to church, and, and I sensed that something was not right in that lady. And I remember she came about four or five times, and I remember shaking her hand, but she wouldn't smile. And I thought, wow, uh, I know something's wrong. And I didn't really say anything. And then the news came that this woman had hung herself. I remember I've thought about every time I preach on the tongue, I always think about that. I thought maybe if I would have just said something. Maybe, there, if, there were, maybe if I would have thought to just talk to her and encourage her, but I didn't do anything of that sort. I just shook her hand and said, hi, good to have you here, and went on. But I thought maybe I could have given her life by my words. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that we need sweet words because like honeycomb and honey, it is sweet to your soul. It is health to your Bones. And so the ministering grace with sweet words can give life to somebody's spirit or it can breach the spirit of someone. Uh, old A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of what they called the old garb churches up north, the General Association of Baptist Churches. And, and he said this, he said, I'd rather play with lightning than speak a reckless word against a servant of Christ. 
Look, look at, we're almost done. We'll be done in about four, three minutes here. Look at Psalm 45, verse 1. Look at this. Oh, my. Look at Psalm 45. He says, the psalmist says, my heart is indicting, a good word. The word indicting means to be thinking, but, but it also means overflowing, bubbling up. Look what he says. My heart is indicting, a good matter. So he's thinking about a good thing. He's thinking about a good thing. And he says, I speak of the things which I have made, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So here's the first thing I learned here. What you think about is going to determine what you say. What you think about. Then look at the next part of the verse. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Notice what's the next phrase say. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. He's talking about the king. He's talking about the beauty of the king, Pharaoh. He says this king is beautiful because grace is poured into his lips. Part of the beauty of this king was his words. His words were gracious and kind words. And I want you to understand that your words and your heart, they go together. They go together. You've got to understand that. Look at, look at Psalms 19, verse 14. Look at Psalms 19. This is a good verse to memorize to use to pray. And it wouldn't hurt any of us to pray it every single day. Look what it says. He says, let the words of my, what's that next thing? Mouth. And the, what's the next word? Meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Boy, the psalmist is right, reminding us of the relationship your mouth and your heart have together. Man, how powerful. You say, Pastor, I can't help it. I'm talking about people. Stop thinking about people. Pastor, I'm having a problem with being critic. Well, stop thinking about critical things. I'm, I'm tired. I, I keep being negative, Pastor. I don't want to be negative. Then think of positive things. Amen. Philippians 4.8. Don't go there, but go there later. It tells you what you ought to think about. Amen. Philippians 4.8. Think on these things. It gives us eight, I think, nine things that you need to think on because if you think on the right things, you will say the right thing. And your sweet words are going to be, your words are going to be sweet because there's sweetness in your heart. Amen. I think about a tea bag. You, you, you pour hot water into a cup with a tea bag in it. As that, as that tea, that water gets into that tea and that tea bag, the water activates the tea in the bag, unleashing its taste into the water around it. The hot water didn't create the taste. It merely revealed or drew out what was already in the bag. Does that make sense to everybody? That illustrates why there are times, well, that's why we have bitter words. That's why sometimes we have sour words. That's why we have negative words. See, in situations, in certain situations, your circumstances don't cause you to say bad words. It's what's in your heart. Your circumstances draw out what's already in your heart. Does that make sense? And so if you're putting in the right things in your heart and in your mind, then my friend, the words that come out of your mouth, even in the worst of times, even when some, somebody does something against you, your words are going to be sweet and grace. Look at Acts 16. In verse 22, and I mean, I'm done, Brother Jewel. Don't look at me like that, Brother Jewel. You were smiling, though. But I know why you were smiling, because you used to be a pastor, and you understand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit, but I'm not finished, amen? And don't you know I'd like to finish this whole thing right now? Oh, look at, look at. Okay, set, set the stage here. Peter and uh, Silas have been taken because they've been preaching. And uh, they've been beaten, and they're thrown in jail. But look at the story, Acts 16, 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they whipped them, and tore up their back, no doubt. 
beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and, and the prisoners heard them. Oh my goodness, the hot water of their suffering, of their enjailment, of their bidding, beatings revealed what was in their hearts, didn't they? Grace had come in their heart and changed their heart. And so when they were taken, they were beaten, they were scored, they were thrown in jail. The words weren't, God, why are you, you doing this? And they weren't mad and, and saying the wrong thing. What did they do? They began to pray. And they began to praise. Amen. Listen. One of the real tests of your Christian character and my Christian character is your words. Mark it down. That is one of the biggest tests of your Christian character. How do you talk? How do you talk at home? How do you talk when you get around certain people? What kind of speech do you have? It should be grace speaking. It should be sweet words. And I can only imagine some people say, well, man, we, we didn't say sweet words this morning. And you're going to have to go home and change that, aren't you? And guess what you just might have to do? You know what, honey? Pastor was right. Because he's always right. <laughs> Amen. As long as I have the Bible, I'm always right. But listen, listen, and it would be maybe for one of you. I guarantee you, somebody needs to do this. Guarantee you. I'm sorry. I'm going to start changing what I think so I can start changing what I say. Hey, man. Oh, listen. God forbid. Now, I can't tell the story I want to, but if this church ever has a split or a problem or where the spirit is ruined in the church, and I can tell you many churches where that happened, can I tell you? how it's going to start. Uh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Your or my or somebody's tongue is going to start it. Amen? Amen? You know how marriages go bad? Uh. This. This. If we just not say what we want to say, you'd be surprised how many problems you'd fix. Amen? Well, she burnt the toast, Pastor. She gave me a burnt offering this morning. Well, you sweet words. Say, honey, this is the best burnt toast I have ever had. Listen, listen, there's always a way. Amen? You don't have to say it. You don't have to. Say, wait a minute, I need some honey. <laughs> okay, I'm ready now. Amen? Amen? Oh, my soul, this could change people's lives. And this could keep so many people from being hurt. Father, thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. Oh, my soul, so much in the Bible about this subject. And, and I think we can all understand why. What, what a fire. What a curse can come from this tongue on people. And I, God, you know my heart, but I don't ever want to be the cause of a broken spirit, of a wounded spirit in anybody's life. And oh, I pray, Lord, that there would be those that know they need to come to this altar, kneel this altar, and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to have sweet words. Let me have that grace that I need to speak the words I need to speak, to give life, to be sweet to the soul of the person that's listening, to bring health to the bones of that person in my life. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, please. Our heads.